Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach of the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my books, Beyond the Lines and Beyond the Game, and it's about leadership, character, and creating a superior culture of excellence. My special guest today is a very successful leader and mayor of our city and county of Honolulu. He is Rick Blangiardi, and today we are going beyond leadership. Hey, Mayor Rick, welcome to Beyond the Lines. Rusty, thank you. I really appreciate being here with you, and congratulations. I wasn't aware that you won 22 state championships. That's got to be a, one of the records forever. You know, who's going to beat that? <laughs> <laughs> well, Mayor Rick, I used to really enjoy talking with you at Honolulu Club in between our workouts. I mean, it was so great seeing and talking with you back then. Thank you. Yep. Same thing. I miss that club, but got another club I'm going to these days and my workouts are getting so tough right now. I used to like to go club, but boy, they get harder and harder. So it's, <laughs> I have a kind of a love-hate relationship with the club. <laughs> yeah. Now, Mayor Rick, I, I know that you played college football for the University of Hawaii for two years. I, um, I want to ask you, what are some of the life's lessons you've learned through football? Well, I played football, you know, throughout my entire college career. Unfortunately, I had to transfer out of Hawaii because of some family emergency back east and then came back here and coached after I graduated. Actually, actually, I was coaching at the University of Connecticut. Look, I think the big thing about any kind of competitive sport is you learn about dealing with adversity, you know, first and foremost, and that and then combined with maybe some intellectual honesty as well, uh, because, you know, you have to be realistic when you're when you're fighting your way into a starting lineup and when you're playing those games and everything else you have to deal with you, you know, you really go inside yourself. So I that and, and just the joy of teamwork. You know, I, I one of the things that I, I really think I took away in all my years of experiences and the success I had both player as a player and as a coach, all those great moments were set, you know, as a result of the teams and the people that I was associated with. So I, I th those are, you know, I think dealing with adversity, teamwork, um, not putting yourself first, you know, that being exposed to some really great people and, and seeing humility at its best, even though they were, you know, really great athletes, all of that stuff has lasted a lifetime for me. Yeah, I like how you said adversity and teamwork for sure. And and Mayor Rick, you were also an assistant football coach for some years. And what did you enjoy about coaching? Well, I think anybody who goes into coaching, it's really a helping relationship, right? So it's about really developing young people. It's putting people in touch with their own potential uh, and getting them to believe in themselves. And, you know, and so many times, uh, when we would take young men on and, you, you know, that's what you work to do is to develop them, you know, was recruiting was one part and this is actually carried over into business as well, but the, it's the recruiting, but then beyond that is retention, it's development. And, you know, are they better as a result of what you've done to coach? You don't really look at that just in terms of the wins and losses of the overall team. And when you're coaching players and you have those positions that you coach, uh, or an effort, for that matter, just the overall culture of a team, it's, it's bringing that to fruition and creating that. Yeah, I, I, love, uh, I love that you were a coach back in the day. And, and Mayor Rick, your wife, Karen, I mean, she has a lot of tremendous qualities. What, what's the biggest thing you admire about your wife, Karen? <laughs> she's an amazing woman uh well she, she has great clarity she can see through stuff and she'll call it for what it is very quickly and that and in addition to that i think she's got great intuition she herself had a very illustrious professional career and she was highly accomplished so um she's really good at that i mean she's a she's a quick study uh, she'll cut through it and um and she 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 can read it for what it is well, you guys definitely make a great team together. And Mayor Rick, how did you first get interested in the TV news industry? Well, it was really out of economic necessity. I was, you know, coaching at the University of Hawaii. I was an associate head football coach and defensive coordinator, uh, which I had a master's degree. And so I was doing everything right professionally. The problem was I wasn't making any money in those days. So Larry Price was the head football coach at the time. And 
I had played for Coach Price, and he was making twenty five thousand dollars a year, and I was making fifteen as an number one assistant. And I had a baby coming, my now forty four year old son, and so I was sort of at a crossroads financially. So unlike the coaches of today, where the salaries get touted in almost unbelievable numbers at all levels, not just in the in the professional level. In fact. Um, the college level was actually outpacing the pro level for a while. Now things are what they are. But I made an economic decision. I had a chance to go back and coach in the mainland. I was 30 years old at the time. I'd coached all during my 20s. Or I'll stay here and kind of reinvent myself um, because of my love of Hawaii and, and try to do something other than coaching because we wanted to live here. And um, had a conversation with C. Seftel at the time, who owned KGMB, and said something to the effect that if I was willing to work hard, that in three years' time, I could make $50,000 a year. Well, that $50,000 number resonated because, for one thing, it was twice as much as Coach Price was making and more than three times what I was making. I had a baby coming. I knew I needed to make money. I wasn't afraid of hard work. So, candidly, I really didn't have any knowledge of what I was going into other than I had a relationship with Joe Moore at the time who was doing sports. He was a young sportscaster over at KGMB and I did interviews with him. But other than that, I literally backed into what became a 43-year television career based on economic necessity with no grand plan other than the fact that I really wanted to stay in Hawaii. Uh, I knew that I could coach football. I knew I could coach college football. And I felt, well, I owed it to my wife with a baby coming to at least try something different. And if all else failed, I think I felt confident at the time was so many years ago now that I could have gone back into coaching, but I never looked back. Well, it's it's fascinating to see how you've really improved um, the TV news industry for those 43 years. And Mayor Rick, what are some of your biggest accomplishments in the TV news industry that you're most proud of? Wow. You know, I honestly have been a really afforded a lot of really great experiences along the way. I started at KGMB, worked there for seven years. But I think first, there's probably three that I want to really cite. The first one was when we took over a rat-infested warehouse in Kali called Kiku, turned it into KHNL, and really launched UH Sports in a way that had never been seen and done before. Uh, and that was a great accomplishment. And then that led to uh, seven years later, six years later, my going to the mainland. And so I had some big jobs. I, uh, I was gone for Hawaii from 89 to 2002. Uh, and in those years, and running King TV was a big accomplishment in Seattle. That was the, what it took me out of. But I, I also was at CBS in New York. And then I was in San Francisco. And, and um, But then when I went to Los Angeles, I became president. I was actually president president of a couple of broadcast companies nationally. But the one that was uh, the last one that I did, Telemundo, Spanish language network, we took a really pretty much, um, you know, uh, really almost a defunct company that uh, was bought by Sony and Liberty Media and a couple of private equity groups and turned that into a really viable contender in the Hispanic marketplace, which was a um, mushrooming, um, you know, uh, population nationally. And so that said, we did such a good job in a little bit more than three years and everything that we did systemically to the company, we ended up selling it to NBC for $2.7 billion which that was a big accomplishment um, because uh, the, the investors that owned it had paid around 500 million. And so in three years, we made them a lot of money. And it was very exciting. It also afforded me the opportunity to come back to Hawaii. And then the last thing I would say is that, you know, this 2008 recession brought all of the local television stations to their knees. And I'd come back to run both KGMB and K2 n simultaneously in 2002, which was something nobody had done before. But given the national experiences. I mean, I came home with a sense of purpose and I, and I made a choice to come back to Hawaii. Uh, so what then transpired um, because of the various, you know, deals that were made and the buying and selling of television stations, then the recession in 2008, which brought all of the ownership in this market to its knees, we had the opportunity to consolidate three television stations, KGMB, KHNL, the NBC affiliate, KGMB to CBS, and K5, and that we formed a company called Hawaii News Now. And we saw in that an opportunity to provide Hawaii with a local news, local television news operation, unlike anything it's seen before, but even more importantly, at that point in time, mobile, te mobile technology, the iPhone had been around for about a year and a half, and none of us could have predicted you know, what would then happen since all these many years, 
but we saw some trends there. We understood the potential of uh, the popularity of personal media over mass media. And we jumped on that right away with Hawaii News Now in the digital distribution. And so over the course of my 10 plus years at Hawaii News Now, the last part of my career, I really felt like we not only provided Hawaii with a 21st century multimedia company, but along with all the other Emmys and Mark Twain, all the awards we won, one of the most decorated stations in America. And a lot of people were looking at us and what we're doing here as being not only revolutionary, but highly innovative. And I was very proud of that. And more than anything, and what it represented as a contribution to the people who live here. Well, you're so right about that, uh, Mayor Rick. And Hawaii News Now definitely was thriving under your leadership. And when you reflect back, what were some of the reasons why you were a successful leader at Hawaii News Now? Well, that's a great question. I would say I always go back. We talked about team earlier. It was a group of men and women that we surrounded ourselves with. And, and we were um, very... Um, you know, we were pretty demanding of ourselves, starting with me, but also what we expected from everybody in that kind of an operation. And so I can tell you that, um, you know, we look for certain common denominators. I look for authenticity. I look for real people, people, especially people we put on camera. Um, I look for passion. But um, at the end of the day, it was really people who understood that what we were doing was in service to the public and that the public would come first and that they had that kind of caring and that kind of mindset. Uh, and so in that regard, because we were evolving with the times and embracing technology and various applications, because as things were unfolding, I mean, we were first started out, nobody was even talking about social media, if you will, but we evolved with the time. So I can tell you the one thing that really worked for us in challenging this young people who were really passionate about the work they were in, who understood the fact that we serve the community. I talk more about innovation that I did improvement. For me, improvement was going to be a given for all of us, myself included. But what was the, what would he, what was, you know, I always talk about managing three kinds of capital. One is the financial, that's sort of a byproduct of the right organization. The other thing really has a lot to do with the human capital, the quality of the men and women that you can, you put together. But then how do you work with the primary derivative of your human capital, which is its intellectual capital. And, you know, how were the ideas that we would embrace? And, you know, so we had a culture like that, a high culture of expectations. We would push ourselves and we constantly look to embrace new ideas and innovate. And I think that really set us apart. Mayor Rick, I, I'm so happy that you mentioned culture right there. I wanna, that that's a huge thing that I talk about in my books and, you know, I, it, it's not just a culture of excellence, but I like to say it's, you know, we're striving for a superior culture of excellence. And I think that's what you did. That's what you, you, your leadership provided at Hawaii News Now, where you created this superior culture of excellence to attract a lot of these quality people to build a great team in front of the camera and behind the camera. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, you know, I have to tell you, they, they, they made a plaque when I left. Uh, that I think is hanging somewhere in that building. And they put on the plaque, the inscription is interesting what people want to remember you by. And it was because I used to always say, you know, no matter how talented they were, I would always challenge them and say, you know, your best is still in front of you. And especially as I, you know, the older I got, the younger everybody looked. So that became even more so in challenging them that way. And they put that on the plaque because that was sort of, that was the expectation, you know, your best work is still in front of you. And then we just worked to kind of create an environment to try to facilitate their going back to your initial question, Rusty, about people reaching their potential to where they could try to become as good as they could become. And that, that for me was about keeping the bar high, acknowledging their success, and then in the proper way, challenging them to do even do that much better. Yeah, acknowledging success, giving that pat on the back goes a long way in, in really moving the team forward and making people feel appreciated. And Merrick, I want to ask you about being mayor. Not many of us know how it feels to be mayor. Yeah. What do you, what I'm do not you so feel? sure. I'm not so sure many of you want to know how it feels to be, how it feels to be mayor, but that, that aside, go ahead. <laughs> well, what do you, what do you feel are the toughest parts of being mayor? 
Well, I think the toughest part for me over the last 13 months now that we've been in office is to come in and operate with a sense of urgency, but then have to somehow learn how to calibrate it uh, with the patience it requires to make things happen in government. Because, um, you know, as much as you want to make things happen quickly, there's, there's a, a dose of realism there. And sometimes it has to do with some of the things we've already done in changing ordinances and some laws that just were getting in the way. But it's sort of like that. You have this incredible sense of we need to make things and make things happen now. And keep in mind, that's been exacerbated because we stepped into office in the middle of a pandemic. So, you know, you're looking to try to make things happen because the need is so great on so many different levels and, and fronts. Um, but, you know, you've got to be realistic. And therein lies the frustration because I think you also have a public that expects you to, you know, make things happen seemingly overnight. Um, and when you don't, you can, you can, feel, the, you can feel the frustration. And we all know that that we can't satisfy everybody. I mean, I, I know that as a coach, but yeah. whenever we make a tough decision and we explain the reasons why, I think people will understand, but really respect why you made that decision, right? Yes, I hope so. I mean, I think we have to do a better job of communicating and it's something that I intend to be able to do on going forward basis, ironically enough, coming out of the communications industry. Uh, I think this past year, quite honestly, we're a little too modest. I felt in the course of the pandemic, we just went about doing our task and people begin to notice just how much we did get done. I don't think that necessarily gets rewarded in politics. I think we've got to be a little bit more uh, demonstrative in all the things that we are doing to give people a feeling, a sense of confidence. But, you know, look, at the end of the day, um, uh, we live in a world right now where there's a lot of unrest, you know, there's certainly a lot of dissatisfaction. I mean, if I get one more push alert, people talking about, you know, the president, how unhappy they are there or, or what politics have become in such a partisan nature to step into a leadership role during a, during a pandemic with high expectations, you know, trying to meet them as quickly as possible. There's going to be people. But I remind myself all the time, we won decidedly. We won by a lot of votes, by over 75,000 votes. There were still 150,000 people who voted for the guy I ran against. Um, and, you know, so, you know, they don't all love you walking into office to begin with. Or they didn't believe in you. And so you've got that uphill battle anyway. And I think at the end of the day, our, our North Star is, are we doing good work? Are we doing what's right and responsible? And is it making a difference? And we continue to hammer against that every day. Mayor Rick, the Red Hill water contamination situation is just such a terrible thing. I mean, such a disaster. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I'm glad you asked me that question because in the beginning I said sort of no comment because, you know, the Board of Water Supply doesn't report directly to the mayor and Ernie Lau is the guy at the table. And at that time, I wasn't being brought into any meetings. And that sort of backfired on me because I was, I come from a place where if I'm not the guy at the table and he was negotiating on behalf of the city and really the state, if you will, with the Navy and he's being, you know, He's privileged to get inside information. I mean, I didn't know enough about it. I now know enough about it. I, I do, I think. And I've been, even though I've been briefed uh, to the extent of realizing it's a matter of national security, I think of what's of greater importance is our local security. Right now, the threat to our aquifer, and I saw the you know the poll just this morning, 64% of the people think we should drain the tanks. I know the government's against doing that, but we have to protect our water, our aquifer, and, uh, and first and foremost, above all else. And I think that um, while the military might not officially admit to that, you know, there's been a lot of mistakes made. Uh, over a long period of time, really a couple of decades, and things were deferred and they should have been dealt with prior. So now, you know, as a result of now, this is the third human error since 2014, and it resulted in um, a really toxic situation for a lot of military families, unfortunately, who were displaced, but it really created to a really heightened awareness the possibility of that threatening everybody uh, with respect to our own aquifer and our own survival is on the line when it comes to that. So this is of critical importance and, and I have every confidence uh, in Ernie Lau and uh, in, in representing the Board of Water Supply and really all of us um, and, you know, and, and everything has worked its way through the legal system now, you know, the, the filings have been made um, and we'll see what happens legally. But, you know, I come down on the side of protecting our local people and doing whatever we have to do to make sure we do that.
Yeah, I mean, it just reaffirms the the importance and the pres preciousness of clean drinking water. And Mayor Rick, I want to ask you about leadership. I mean, I, the the greatest leaders um, are proactive rather than reactive, and, and that's what you are. You're a proactive leader. Thank what you. what other what other qualities do you feel the greatest leaders possess? That's a great question, Rusty. You know, I've always been struck, um, you know, by by humility. You know, uh, the people that I've met who have really been highly accomplished in their life, um, you know, you know that about them, but they're not advertising it. You know, and and there's that kind of that kind of inner confidence, if you will. Um, it's also, I think, I've already alluded to two of the qualities I like to look for. You know, you, they're authentic, they're real people, uh, and they're comfortable in their own skin and 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 who they are, uh, and they're also passionate about what they do. I mean, I don't think anybody accomplishes anything great uh, in this world uh, without having a real love for what they're doing. So I I, I think you know. Um, that I mean, it's a consistency too. You know, you 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 need to be consistent in situations that I've been asked to step into when I've replaced somebody after I was always that guy that got hired to turn something around. Um, you know, you you can see that there were you know the people who preceded you, part of their shortcomings or why they failed. I was I was I was that guy. They fired somebody, then they hired me and said fix it. You know, uh, was the inconsistency. You know, and how they dealt with people or decision making or whatever. So, you know, in in a spirit of being fair and ethical and so on and so forth. So, I, I think being transparent is really important. One, I also think having good communication skills. You got to be able to talk with people. Management leadership is a, is an intensely human experience, um, and so. You have to be somebody who is willing to engage people, talk with them, um, and be straightforward with them, not just on performance issues, but engage them, care about them. Um, you know, we talk about coaching. You get a lot from your players. You know, they they want to they want to perform for the coach. You know, you have to build that trust in that respect. So, it's about building trust. That's a big one. You got to build trust in your organization. If you don't have trust, it doesn't happen. You can't have a team without trust. I completely agree with everything you said right there. I, I, I love everything you said there. And it th those are all things that's in the books, Mayor Rick. <laughs> well, that's good. Well, you're the guy writing books. I'm just trying to hammer it out day by day, Rusty. But I look, I know that you are really highly regarded in that regard. And I think what you do is a great service to chronicle things like this so people can learn and see, you know, because I do believe uh, and I perceive now I'm 75 years old. I've been enamored with the subject of leadership since I can remember. And I've always tried to get better. I pride myself on being a lifelong learner. And I do think that leadership is a skill that you can evolve in. You can get better. This notion of, while well, some people are leaders and some are not. If you want to lead, you can learn how to lead. And, and, you know, and part of what you do is help show people how to do that. And I think that that's terrific. I really yeah, do. I mean, we both agree that great leaders are made and, and the greatest leaders are always learning. That's what makes yeah. them even greater, like you said. And Mayor Rick, you know what? I, I mean, there's a lot of people that really admire and respect you when when there's protests going on. I saw that when when the wedding people were protesting outside Honolulu Hale, you came down to really hear their concerns and engage yeah. with them. Can yeah. you tell me more about that? Well, it was really an impromptu deal. I mean, I, I went down a few times, I mean, even a couple of times with the people who were here to protest mandatory vaccinations or vaccines in general. Um, no, look, we knew the wedding industry was hurting. I mean, it was no question. And we came in and it was, it became evident actually during the campaign, because again, you know, we were, doing all of that, you know, in the early months before there was even a vaccine. Uh, and, you know, the industries were closing, people were losing businesses, and clearly restaurants and weddings were being hammered, as well as funerals. I mean, I talked to the Funeral Association. I mean, you know, they weren't burying people and we really all kinds of things like that. So I knew that, you know, weddings are not just a wedding. You know, there's all these other related businesses that go into it as part of celebrating life. And so when they were here, we went down and look, it, they didn't come here in a hostile way to their credit. We ended up all taking pictures together. We tried to sensitive. And, you know, some people didn't understand what our jurisdiction was, but 
The city and county of Honolulu does not have a Department of Health. And so we yield to the state's Department of Health. And it, under an emergency proclamation, that is the law of the land. And a lot of people thought we had the unilateral powers here at the mayor's office, which we did not. So we went through a lot in trying to negotiate with the state at various times to allow us as we were moving through the tier system, which was up until last year, the first six months, because it's just as we approached the 4th of July weekend, we thought we were over the hump and then Delta came along a couple of weeks later. Um, but we, we, we just wanted to try to get as many businesses back on their feet. Uh, and also in this particular case, you know, uh, weddings are such a joyous experience of life and people are going through all this unprecedented hardship. So even all the more, just because of what weddings represented and not only that, the business of the weddings was a very good thing to get going. So we, we did everything we could, and we got it going. Well, you know, there's not too many leaders that will go and uh, really engage with protesters. And, and I think that all, all the leaders should because they, they need to hear these concerns. And I'm so glad you did that. And Mayor Rick, I wanna ask you one more thing before we wrap up. Wow, when is you it that fast? I thought we were gonna do two hours. I thought you said, Rusty, we're gonna do two hours. I just warmed up. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I'm gonna to have to do a part two. I could definitely yeah, I do a show with you. you here. I didn't know we were ready to call it set match here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, Mayor Rick, when you reflect back on your life so far, what's, what's an important, valuable lesson that you learned about life so far? Well, to first of all, really appreciate those people in the inner circle, the people who really care about your life. You know, it's my children and my wife and maybe a couple of close friends. I never try to delude myself with any form of celebrity thinking, you know, the world loves you. We already talked about that today. But those people who are really in the inner circle, when it all gets said and done and I leave the planet and those people will really be affected by that to take good care of those people and love those people and make sure that I keep them as close as I can and support them and love them as much as I possibly can. Um, and that's one of the things that I've really learned to appreciate as I've gotten older. The other things that I've gotten, I've, I've really gotten to learn just, uh, just two quick things as I've, and I've gone, we've all gone through it during this pandemic. I've learned a couple of things. I've learned that people as they age, people grieve differently. I don't judge people on how they grieve. You know, because I've seen people not cry a tear to a parent and almost, you know, have a breakdown over a pet dying. I mean, all, all over the place. And you just, you know, it's hard to, I, I don't try to project that on anybody. And the other thing, and I think this has been really true during the pandemic, is that people fear differently. You know, I, I don't try to judge people. What, what might not be something that feels threatening to me might really scare you. And I've learned to respect that. So between grief and fear. So it's kind of like loving and, and how people grieve and how people fear, but it's it's in that context as far as the real human lessons. And then the last thing I would say is to just expect a lot from yourself. You know, I mean, I never saw myself becoming mayor and made this decision. I was 73 years old to even run, and I didn't know what chapters were there, but I, I want to go through life as aggressively and as hard as I can and give everything I can. And as I once read a great line written by George Bernard Shaw, great Irish playwright back in 1903 in a play called Man and Superman, he simply was talking about servant leadership. He says, you know, he said, the, the harder I work, the more I live, the more I love. And he simply says, because I want to be used up when I die. And when I read those lines some 30 years ago, I thought, you know what? That's the way to go through it. Mayor Rick, I love hearing your insights. I mean, you are, you've been successful everywhere you've been. And I want to thank you for being on the show today. You, you are someone that definitely goes beyond the lines. Thank you, Rusty. That's a great compliment coming from you. And it's been a real privilege to speak with your audience. And hopefully I said something that'll have some meaning and value for someone. Thank you, Mayor Rick. Okay, and nice. thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. For more information, please visit rustykomori.com. And my books are available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I hope that Mayor Rick and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha. <laughs>